Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, there's no stopping the good economic news right now, and it's been this way for a while. It may not be as robust and as broad as pre-recession levels, but undeniably, most indicators, even the total ones, assume better times ahead. Happiest of holidays, welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and from elephant hunting the new Boeing facility to transportation policy and education slash workforce challenges to the trickle-down effect in health and human services. We will talk about the critical items facing our region. And joining the dialogue later is mega manufacturer Sunoco Products' new CEO. Jack Sanders will be here, too. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded December 9th, 2013. On this week's program, Doug Copeland of the Business Journal of the Greater Triad, David Lockwood of Colliers International, and special guest Jack Sanders, President and CEO of Sonoco. Now, here's Chris Williams. Happy holidays. Welcome to our program. Uh, guys, welcome back. Good to have you both here. Great. Thank you. No red ties? No holiday things? <laughs> What's that all about? Didn't get the memo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Doug, I'll start with you. A lot of things. Um, uh, in the triad, you know, um, it, you know, a lot of folks that, that fly out of Charlotte complain about the, the airfare, so they'll end up going to, to Greensboro, GSO. With this U.S. Airway merger now complete, what kind of risk is, is GSO at with flights, with U.S. Airway flights? Well, not being a hub, we're always at risk, but I think the market will drive what happens with lights in the triad much more than the merger, if you will. Yeah, okay. Let's stay on this whole issue of transportation. David will bring you in here. Um, uh, transportation in South Carolina, uh, Bob St. Ange, who's your DOT, DOT executive, DOT secretary of DOT, let's try to get this right, sat in this chair, and he said to us, he said he's presiding over an agency in decline, talking about transportation, talking about not being able to keep up with the costs it takes to maintain roads in the Palmetto State. So there's been a lot of debate about raising the gas tax, and here it is now bubbling over to maybe a, a real reality with an idea that there might be a, a proposed five cent increase in, in the tax on gasoline to help with DOT. What are the odds of getting something like that or, or some way to raise revenue that's, that's brand new to affect? transportation. I think what you said is get something and I think that we will get something this coming legislative season. I think there's strong support for a gas tax. No one likes increasing taxes but I think the business community recognizes that we have to do something about our roads, about our infrastructure uh, to maintain the momentum that we've started with a lot of great announcements over the last couple of years with Boeing, with the Inland Port. Uh, we've, we see a lot of economic development but I think the infrastructure is something that is really slowing us down and so I think the legislature, I think the governor will mm -hmm. be forced into doing something just because the business community and even a lot of the, the constituents out there recognize it's a major problem for South yeah, Carolina. You know, let's, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let's, let's talk about that for a second because Winthrop, Winthrop University came out with a poll and it's the first time that the public, according to this poll, 
uh, were in favor of some type of tax increase, in this case, the gas tax. You've got even the, the trucking association across the state is favoring this. You've got legislators talking about it. So really, it sounds, uh, and it's not fair to say it this way, it sounds like the governor is almost the only one against this, and this would be the right time to do this. Right. I think a lot of the constituents go to North Carolina, they go to Florida, they go to Georgia. They experience what a really good road system looks like, what it feels like. And when you cross the line, you come back in South Carolina, you notice it that yeah. we are severely deficient. So I think the governor will be forced into doing something, but I believe it, it is all in the discussions and the negotiations with the legislature. And, and by the way, the constituents in North Carolina and Georgia will drive to South Carolina because the gas, gas. is 16 cents cheaper right. in most cases. Um, Doug, David mentioned a, a word here, Boeing. Boeing has now shown, shown up, not just in South Carolina because of the, the, the dramatic influence down in the low country, but Boeing said they're looking for another location. Uh, mayor Nancy Vaughn, new mayor Nancy Vaughn in Greensboro said that Greensboro is aggressively going to go after this. Mm -hmm. Charlotte has thrown his hat in the ring. I've got to think somewhere with Honda Jet and FedEx up in the triad, or the, 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 the bones of FedEx mm -hmm. being in the triad, this would be something that's a possibility. But how much of a probability is Greensboro? Well, there's a long shot probably because of geogra geography and land. That's probably the big challenge for our market in terms of the right piece of land in the right place. We have a lot of assets. As you said, we've become a transportation manufacturing cluster. Uh, that exists in Timco, in Honda Jet, in BE Aerospace, and a half a dozen other much smaller companies. So we have, one, the skilled workers already in place. Two, we have the training programs in the community college in place in the skills they need. Three, we have runway capability, and that's huge for the whole aviation industry because we do have um, underused runways, and so that, that's, in this case, mm -hmm. sort of backwards, but it's a good thing. So the question is, can we put together the right package, and can we find the place that works for Boeing? You know, you talk about a place that works for Boeing. Is this something where the, that, you know, that, that elephant we have down east, that global trans park, could actually make sense? for a manufacturer like that? Well, I'm not going to admit that for a second. We're going to, we're, I'm going to follow the, the mayor's lead on this, and we are going to be aggressive in trying to get it in the yeah. triad. Uh, I've got to ask you this, David. Uh, clearly a great relationship with Boeing. Uh, you know, the, the pre-Boeing relationship of BMW has been a, has been a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, win for not just South Carolina, but, but, but the Carolinas in general. So is Boeing, and, and excuse my terminology here, but is Boeing playing other places to try to get the best deal they can in the Palmetto State? Well, I was going to take exception to say North Carolina is a really good place because I think South Carolina has an advantage with Boeing already being there. And I think South Carolina is going to be incredibly aggressive to try to land that new group. And um, I think we've got a very strong advantage over other states. It's, it's not to say that another state might not come in and want to buy that deal, uh, but I think South Carolina has a very good opportunity ahead of itself. Uh, let, let me ask you one thing, David, specific to your industry. You've been in the commercial real estate development business now for more than a, a couple of years. Uh, we hear so much about residential real estate, the snapback in all right. the markets, even along the coast. Um, what's happening in commercial real estate? You don't hear quite the same buzz or the mojo in commercial space. Well, first, residential real estate has come back in a very strong way. If you drive around parts of North Carolina, parts of Charlotte, and the metro areas in the Carolinas, you will see land being developed for subdivisions. You will see really good housing statistics. So I think the residential market is back in a very strong way, and we see appreciation of prices. Once you really start to see res the residential market um, reacting very strongly, the commercial markets follow suit. And all of the markets throughout the Carolinas mm -hmm. are doing very well. We see increasing rents in most property types. We see new development starting to occur in most of the markets. Not all of the markets, but most of them. And now you're starting to see speculative construction enter the market again. Charlotte has a lot of speculative construction on the drawing boards. Raleigh has construction underway. So we've recovered very nicely, but it's very cautious optimism right now. What about, just quickly, what about the Bull Street project with, uh uh, with that, that, that whole idea of 160 plus acres, is that stalled out or Bull, is that? Bull Street in Columbia will eventually develop. It is just a very slow, methodical process. Columbia is probably the last major market of the metro areas in the Carolinas that will see new development. But Bob Pugh's has a yeah. very, very good plan for that. And I think we'll start to see retail 
and probably some type of residential coming into that development first before we see other components. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, but if, if many people say, and I know you'll agree with this, that if anybody can do that project, Bob Hughes out of Greenville can probably get that Correct. thing done. Uh, stay with us. We're going to bring our guests on, and I and let you off the hook about the uh, Partnership for Prosperity question, too, <laughs> and a North Carolina uh, we'll know in a commerce week. group. Yeah, we'll know in a week. Uh, okay, so next week on this program, uh, we are going to be speaking with North Carolina's Lieutenant Governor. His name is Dan Forrest. He will be here to talk about all things policy, as well as the challenges facing not just the Republican Party, but what North Carolina needs to do around education and around some of the things that are challenged right now. And then in two weeks, we have our annual economic review of 2013 and a look, a look ahead to 2014 with our four standard economists will be back in, I'm sure, arguing points on the program. Program. According to a Booz and Company study released last year, organically grown CEOs tend to perform better, last longer, and benefit the organization more than hiring from outside the company. Enter our special guest, steadily rising through the ranks. He is closing in now on three decades with the Palmetto State's Fortune 500 company being named CEO this past April. We welcome. So, Sunoco President and Chief Executive Officer Jack Sanders. Jack, welcome and congratulations on the job and gosh, great 2013. How do you, how do you top that? <laughs> First of all, thank you for letting let me be here today, Chris. 2013 um, is the beginning, hopefully. Uh, I think that uh, as we put together our plans going forward, uh, I feel I have an excellent team and we have a pretty strong vision for the company and and how we want to drive forward. So hopefully it's a, a good beginning. Jack, you know, here's the thing, and and I know you know this, but y y y Sunoco is not a, a Johnny-come-lately to the global business at all. I mean, you've been doing it now for decades, literally decades. And globalization has been a wonderful phenomenon for this country and for the globe, in fact, in the last 10 or 15 years. But, but you all have been doing it for a long time, and you've been deeper than one or two markets. And I'm talking about mm -hmm. South America, Eastern Europe, uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, you know, all the way over to, to Asia and the Pacific Rim. What do you see? What do you all see, in, you know, when it comes to hot spots, good spots? I mean, what's your take on the global economy now, and where are you careful about stepping? Well, you know, one of the things that's very interesting today is that the global economy is so knitted together that a shock here is no longer isolated in that one region. It's become interchangeable and it, it resonates around the world when you have that. So that's, 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 that's changing the world dynamic a bit. But I think as we look around the world as far as opportunity, we certainly see uh, a good bit of growth in Eastern Europe. We'll be opening our third plant in Russia about mid-year next year. Uh, and we continue to see that market is growing and continuing to grow, expanding into the Middle East this year mm -hmm. uh, as well. So we, we, we see continued opportunity in what we call the frontier arena of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, still see Southeast Asia as a strong growth area. Um, but at, as I look forward and as we see it now for the next three plus years, I think the developed world, I think the U.S. and Europe will probably help drive economic growth around the world and certainly it would be a large focus area for us uh, to improve our businesses in these areas. Really? So you think the, the more domestic markets, as you just said, that's, that's a better opportunity than maybe emerging? The way we see it, at least for the next couple of years. Okay. I think they're more stable, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you're going to see them rebound um, at a little bit faster pace than they have to this point. Yeah. Doug? You have a unique perspective in participating in both ends of the supply chain, if you will, pre and post. We're writing a lot about the growth of manufacturing in this country, particularly in the southeast region. Quantify that. Is it really happening? Is it for real? Is it economic growth? Is it coming back from overseas? What do you see? Well, I certainly believe there is a, an onshoring or a resurgence in American manufacturing, and I believe it's driven by low-cost energy. If you're the low-cost producer of energy, uh, by default, I would say you become the low-cost producer of steel because of the high energy cost to produce steel, and you become a low-cost producer of resin. If you step back from that, what's not made from steel or resin? Uh, most everything today is in some format made from steel or resin. As far as the speed at which that occurs, I remember a great quote I heard a long time ago. It was from the, a CEO of a tech company in the early days of the Internet. And what he said was that people often tend to overestimate the speed or pace of change, but then they underestimate the absolute magnitude of the change. And I believe that's exactly where we are in this process. It's just beginning. 
So the speed is not, it's not going to happen as fast as we might think it will, but I think it may actually be bigger than what we estimate it to be today. So I am a believer in onshoring uh, manufacturing into the U.S., and I think it's going to have a significant impact on this country. Following up on that question, you have the opportunity to put manufacturing operations probably anywhere in the world, but to drill down into North and South Carolina, and we're really blessed to have Sunoco domiciled in the Carolinas, but if we were trying to recruit Sunoco to the Carolinas, what advantages do we really have and maybe what concerns would you have as the President and CEO about locating an operation in the Carolinas? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think as we as we think about South Carolina, we think in, uh, of three basic things to uh, I improve that environment. First, education. Uh, that's absolutely critical. We have to have an excellent education system that, that people are drawn and willing to come to. We have to recruit uh, into Hartsville, into the PD area, so that's, that's very important for us. Uh, I, I would tell you that infrastructure uh, is critical. We absolutely must have an infrastructure that allows us not only to get products into and out of, but people into and out of, uh, and effectively, uh, and used effectively. Uh, and the, fi the third one would be, a, uh, I would say, a tax code uh, that's fair for business. I think uh, South Carolina has the highest industrial uh, property tax rate and maybe the sixth or seventh highest commercial tax rate. So I think that that entire tax code probably needs to be redone to be more business friendly, if you will, to draw other companies into the state as well as to help us continue to draw high quality talent to the state. So, so to follow up with David Zajek, so Sunoco has, there's no doubt, Sunoco has a bully pulpit and the state house is going to listen and a lot of people are going to listen. How does Sunoco, or rather, who, who leads, who leads the change, or who leads the change, or who leads the example? Is that, is that a, a team of Sunoco employees working in a local school? Is that you spending more time in Columbia getting to know these legislators and really having them see the whites of your eyes and know how important this is to the constituents at Sunoco? So who leads that effort? Who leads that change? Is it business? Is it policy? Is it nonprofit? Where does that start? Well, I, you know, Chris, I think that maybe on two separate levels. Locally, I think it's uh, Sunoco. We have to get directly involved, and we have been. Uh, we got involved in a pulse, what's called the Pulse Program. It's a, uh, an education initiative uh, of significance. The governor's school is there in, uh, in Hartsville, where we're, we're headquartered as well. So locally, we have to be an active participant uh, in, um, uh, in the community. Uh, on a state level, I think it's important for us to be a part of the, uh, the, the chamber, uh, a part of the South Carolina Manufacturing Association, the Palmetto Business Forum. I think we need to pull together with other businesses or other businesses across the state in these different uh, councils uh, and really begin to push an agenda, kind of put forward that we believe this is what's best uh, for South Carolina and South Carolina business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doug? You have such a large footprint, this is a tough question to an answer specifically, but what we're seeing in the whole manufacturing realm is not enough high, highly educated workers in terms of, of automation, tech savvy, et cetera. Who's doing it best? What's needed? Just a wide open answer about, because this isn't just coming out of the recession or the change. This is going to go on forever now. Well, I, I, that's an outstanding question as to who's doing it best. I'm not certain. But I do know that this is drastically different than uh, when the soldiers came home from World War II and showed up at a facility and got a job. It's not like that anymore. Uh, if you're going to run a machine today, you better understand PLCs. And if you're going to be in a high-end manufacturing operation, you need to understand analytical troubleshooting. You need to be able to have those skills, uh, even some soft skills uh, around problem solving and Six Sigma type applications. We need more of that type of uh, training. And I think that there's an opportunity um, between these business forums and business in general uh, and then certainly the tech schools that exist uh, across the state of South Carolina. Uh, I know that there's Florence Darlington Tech uh, that they're, that's there in the Florence Darlington area. We're working with them to craft a specific program to help train our employees uh, for Hartsville Mill Complex, and it revolves around PLCs. It revolves around analytical, tr analytical mm -hmm. troubleshooting skills. What is PLCs? Tell, tell me what PLCs Printed logic. Printed logic circuit, I think, okay. and it's okay. just computer computerized. Okay, all right. All right. Uh, util utilizing that type of technology, and it it requires different skill sets uh, than it did 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, David. I think it would be it's rare for us to have the opportunity to to interview a real global manufacturer, so it's a privilege being here. But 
when you look around the world at your operations, what really keeps you up at night? Is it interest rates? Is it, is it world peace? Is it political strife? What is it? Well, to something I referenced earlier, um, it used to be isolated. The world used to be somewhat isolated. What happened in the U.S. impacted the U.S. and it had some trickle over effect. But now the globe is so interconnected and certainly political instability anywhere in the world. Obviously, when you have political instability in the Middle East, it impacts all prices in Nebraska, whether it has anything to do with the cost of taking oil out of the ground in Nebraska or, or the Dakotas, probably not, but it impacts oil. So that, that interconnectivity mm -hmm. now uh, is so deep that any kind of shock around the world has an impact on the rest of the world. Of course, I would tell you the other piece of it is probably interest rates. There's so much liquidity now uh, based upon uh, the Fed action over the last several years that that's going to stop, and when it stops, it's going to have a knock-on effect as the government tries to tamper, to use their word. You, you know, you, you know. I think I think you. Well, I know you've struck on something here. I think we have taken. It seems, Jack, and this is a question: uh, Have we taken for granted the cost of capital is so cheap and has been so cheap for long, so long? Uh, you know, at some point that's going to rise. So how do you how do you how do you make sure that you're protected against that? Well. I, uh, one of the things you do is you stay, in our opinion, fiscally conservative. Uh, Sunoco has been and remains a fiscally conservative company. Uh, you know, our debt ratios are fairly low. We've got good coverage mm -hmm. on, on an EBITDA basis, so, and we will continue that. Um, so we think that protects us uh, in any type of downturn uh, going forward. I think what it's done, however, is it's probably put people in businesses that wouldn't normally be in businesses. Uh, certainly uh, investment banking, private equity, uh, they've invested in a lot of businesses that perhaps they wouldn't have gotten in, but because money's so cheap, you know, they were able to jump into those businesses. Mm -hmm. The effect that that'll have is going to be interesting as interest rates start to rise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've been in this, you've been in this company for decades, you've been in this position eight or nine months. What's the most fun you have in your new, <laughs> in your new job? Yeah, I would tell you, it's, it's really beginning to push a single vision. Uh, I'm very, I'm very much focused on a shared vision across an organization, uh, and very much a collaborative person by nature. I wanted my executive team to have total buy-in. Uh, I think, I, to coin a term I use the other day, I believe firmly that that executive leadership team is all in, and so now pushing that vision through the entire organization and ensuring we can connect every individual job to the vision. How does what you do mm -hmm. help promote? what we want to do collectively as a whole. So that really is the most fun to me. Start a program called Java with Jack, uh, and it's just a chance to get together with 20 people and have them begin, let me walk through our one-page plan, and then start talking mm -hmm. and having a dialogue about what is it that we want to do uh, and how does their job connect to the whole. I have a couple minutes left, David, and I want to take uh uh, I want to take the last couple of minutes. I want to quote a couple of people to you. Harris Deloach, your, your chairman, guy that you worked with for many, many years and was CEO right before you, and Cheryl Stanton. Cheryl is uh, Secretary of Deploy uh, uh, Department of Employment and Workforce in South Carolina. And, and Harris said on this program, and I wrote this down, um, at, when we were talking about this, this skills gap, he said, yeah, that's important, but really what's more important to Sunoco was this idea of finding the critical thinkers, finding the folks that were in, innovative and creative. And Cheryl Stanton said when they're trying to figure out what the skills gap, she said she was surprised when she took the job at DEW in South Carolina that there wasn't a statewide unified strategy for this skills gap thing. So. Hearing what Harris did, hearing what Cheryl's response, Jack, how do you come down on this issue of skills gap and critical thinking and finding the right people? Well, <clears throat> I would tell you skills gap is going to be somewhat situational. Uh, I, I think what skill gap you might have in automotive assembly is going to be somewhat different than it is in paper making. So somewhat it's going to be regional. There are some universal skills that we need. Again, I think it goes back to PLC capability or analytical troubleshooting skills, and I think that's where we can work with uh, the, the, tech, the um, technical college network to create this across a wide area, even across larger than South Carolina, but certainly regionally, to create the capability to teach those skills without having to have those specially designed. Yeah. 
I think there is the capability of doing that. Well, I, you know, I didn't give you enough time to talk about that or the LSU season, which I'm sure you want to, <laughs> would like to chat about, but we'll have to do that next time <laughs> and hopefully a, a, a good season. Thanks, Jack, for being on the program. Thank you. Congratulations going forward. I appreciate that. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Doug, nice to see you again. Thank you, Chris. Happy holidays. David, thank you for being on the program again. Glad to be here. Good luck in Columbia. Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching our program. Until next week, and happy holidays to you. Thank you for watching. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care, when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.